How to think about motivation? We'll think about it from the hypothalamic perspective. So we could say one thing that motivation does is set goals. And we could say that emotions track progress towards goals. And I'm going to use that schema, even though it's not exactly right. So you say, well, motivation determines where you're going to aim. So if you're hungry, you're going to aim at something to eat. And then that will organize your perceptions so that you zero out everything that isn't relevant to that task, which is almost everything. You concentrate on those few things that are going to facilitate your movement forward. When you encounter those things, that produces positive emotion as you move through the world towards your goal and you see that things are laying themselves out that facilitate your movement forward. Those things cause positive emotion. And if you encounter anything that gets in the way, then that produces negative emotion and it can be like threat, because you're not supposed to encounter something that gets in the way. It can be anger, so that you move it away. It can be frustration, disappointment, grief. Those would, if, if you had a response that serious to an obstacle, it would probably punish the little motivated frame right out of existence. You know, so you walk downstairs and, I don't know, the contracting company has set a wrecking ball through your kitchen. It's like, that's going to be disappointing. You're not going to keep eating the peanut butter sandwich in the rubble. That little frame is going to get punished out of existence and some new goal is going to pop up in its stead. And you know, one of the things we're going to try to sort out is how do you decide when you've encountered an obstacle that's so big that you should just quit and go do something else? Because that's not obvious. You know, and you can, you can get into counterproductive persistence pretty easily. So we, we don't know how people solve that problem. It's a really complicated one. So anyways, we're going to work on that scenario. Your hypothalamus pops up micro goals that are directly relevant to biological survival. That produces a frame of reference. So it's not a goal, it's not a drive, and it's not a collection of behaviors. It's a little personality. And the personality has a viewpoint, it has thoughts that go along with it. It has perceptions, it has action tendencies, all of that. You can see this in addiction, most particularly. So, one of the things that you find often with people who are alcoholic is they lie all the time. And that's because when they're, they built a little alcohol dependent personality inside of themselves, or a big one, it might, maybe it's 90% of their personality. And one of, that, one of the things that compo consists of is all the rationalizations that they've used over the years to justify their addiction to themselves and to other people. And so the addiction has a personality. You know, and so when the person is off, or maybe they're addicted to meth or something like that, where you know, the addiction is more, it's, it's, it's more short-term powerful, than I would say, than an alcohol addiction. They'll say anything. And the, 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 the words are just tools used to get towards the goal. And if they happen to be deceptive, whatever, it doesn't matter. They're just practical tools to get towards the goal. And then when you get towards the goal and you take a nice shot of meth or something like that, you reinforce all those rationales that you use to get the drug and then the next time you're even a better deceiver and liar. So, okay, so we're going to say motivations, one way of thinking about it is they set goals, but it's not the right way of thinking about it. They produce a whole framework of interpretation. And so we're going to think about that framework of interpretation. And then emotions emerge inside of that. So that's it. So the world is framed, motivation set goals. You could say the world has to be framed. So motivation sets that frame. Cruise goals, emotions, perceptions, and actions. And then actions track progress. So positive emotion says you're moving forward properly towards your goal. And if you encounter something you don't expect, you stop. That's anxiety. It's like, oh, we're not where we thought we were. And so we don't know what to do. So we should stop because we don't know where we are, what we're doing. Stop. Frozen. And then the more powerful negative emotions like pain, they might make you get out of there. So emotions, forward, stop, reverse. That's your emotions within that motivated frame. So, and that's another example of how your mind is embedded in your body. You know, emotions are like they're, they're offshoots of action tendencies. That's, that's the right way to think about it. Because action is everything, fundamentally. So what are some basic motivations? Uh, most of these are regulated by the hypothalamus, by the way, and that, that tells you just how important a control system it is. The other thing that's useful to know about the hypothalamus is that it has projections going up from it that are like tree trunks, and inhibitory projections coming down that are like grape vines. So you can kind of control your hypothalamus as long as it's not on too much, but if it's on in any serious way, it's like, it, it wins. So partly what you do 
to stop yourself from falling under the dominion of your hypothalamus is to never ever be anywhere where its action is necessary, right? You don't want to go into a biker bar because you might find yourself in a situation where panicked defensive aggression is immediately necessary. You probably don't want that. You don't want the panic, you don't want the terror, you don't want the frenzied fight, you don't want any of that. You don't want to have to run away in absolute panic. So you just don't go there. And then a huge, a huge part of how we regulate our emotions is just by never going anywhere where we have to experience them. And so that has very little to do with internal inhibitory control and everything to do with staying where you belong. So, okay. So, basic motivations. Hunger, thirst, pain. Pain is not regulated by the hypothalamus. That's a different circuit. Anger slash aggression. Thermal regulation. Panic and escape. Affiliation and care, sexual desire, exploration, play. And you can kind of break those in. You can kind of break those into uh, the classic Darwinian categories too and say, well, there's a set of motivations that go along with self maintenance. That'd be your survival, ingestive and defensive. See, I've sort of coded them there. So the, the self maintenance. There's an ingestive set of basic motivations that go with self-maintenance. You say that's hunger, thirst. There's a set of defensive motivations. Pain, anger, thermal regulation, panic and escape. And then there's, there's motivations that are associated with reproduction, affiliation, care, and sexual desire. And then I put exploration in place sort of outside of that. Uh, I would say because those two things serve both of these approximately equally. When people share good news about their life, People don't necessarily respond positively. You know, they don't get encouragement. And people need so little encouragement. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. And so they'll tell me something good, and I'll think, oh, that's so good. You know, somebody says, oh, I'm getting a long way better with my father. I haven't seen him for 10 years, and now we get along. It's like, God, mm. great. Yeah. And then the, the power of that, you can't overstate the power of that for individuals to get their life together. The individual is an unbelievably powerful force. And every single person who gets their act together a little bit has the capacity to spread that around them. Mm. It's, it's a chain reaction. And so it's a lovely thing to see. You have to treat yourself like you matter. Because if you don't, then you don't take care of yourself. And you become vengeful and, and, and cruel. And you, you, take, you take it out on people around you. And you're not a positive force. None of that's good. So you suffer more and so does everyone around you. And there's a malevolence that enters into it. None of that's good. So that's what happens if you don't treat yourself like you matter. And then, well, what happens if you don't treat other people like they matter? Well, you lie to them, you cheat them, you steal, you, you, you enter into impulsive relationships with them. They can't trust you. That doesn't go anywhere. They don't like you. You, you end up alone at best and maybe like in, in, incarcerated at worst. Like that doesn't work. And so, you watch the people around you who thrive, regardless of what they say. They act out the proposition that everyone matters. And then you have a functional society. And I think, okay, well, if, if, if when you act out the proposition that everyone matters, you have a functional society, maybe that's evidence that that proposition is true. It's like, I think it's, I think it's true. One of the things that's really interesting about the Old Testament is that, and the Jews in the Old Testament is that, they don't take the path of Cain. Every time they're walloped by God, which is like fairly frequently, they say, we must have done something wrong and we have to set ourselves right. And that's a, an unbelievably heroic attitude because that's the alternative to cursing fate. It's like you take the responsibility for failure onto yourself and you think, well, if I was just, maybe if I just had my act together a little bit more, if I took advantage of every opportunity that was put in front of me, if I wasn't resentful and bitter, then I could have done something that would have tilted the situation in a different direction. And like, that's almost inevitably true. Dostoevsky, I think, said something like, every man is responsible for everything that happens to him and everything that happens to everyone else. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's a, it's a crazy statement, right? It's a crazy statement. And he was a pretty extreme person in many, many ways but there's a level at which that's metaphysically true, you know, because what happens is that it's, it's failure to act often that's the most catastrophic, you know, I mean, I've, uh, it's, it's, it's to not do the right thing when the, when the situation presents itself. And 
it's very specific. You know, you're constantly in situations where you could do the right thing if you were willing to take a risk that's actually of relatively moderate size. And you know that you could take the risk and you know that you should take the risk and you don't. And that happens to people all the time. And then what happens is the thing that they didn't oppose grows a little bit and they shrink a little bit. And that starts a loop, hey.